From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. Welcome to this JAMA Clinical Reviews podcast. I am Dr. David Simel, JAMA Associate Editor and Professor Emeritus of Medicine at the Durham Veterans Affairs Medical Center and Duke University. In this podcast, we will be discussing arteriovenous access for hemodialysis. I'm joined today by Dr. Charmaine Locke, who is Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Locke is the lead author of a narrative review on this topic, published in the March 18th, 2024 edition of JAMA. Dr. Locke, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Simel, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's get right into it. Tell us how arteriovenous access is used during actual hemodialysis. Okay, well, I guess before we do that, maybe we should explain what an arteriovenous access is. In this podcast, we'll refer to them as arteriovenous fistula and arteriovenous grafts. And so an arteriovenous fistula is a connection between an artery and a vein. And so by convention, the name of the fistula tells you what arteries and veins are connected. So for example, a radiocephalic fistula would connect a radial artery to a cephalic vein. And what happens when we have that connection, the systemic vascular resistance drops, the artery dilates, and the vein matures, which means dilates or toughens. And I'm telling you this because this is really important when we're talking about using it for dialysis. So when a fistula is created, the blood flow actually increases quite dramatically. With a graft, it's a connection between a synthetic or a non-autogenous tube between an artery and a vein, and that maturation isn't required. And so for dialysis, two needles go either into the mature vein or the non-autogenous graft. So what happens during dialysis? So before the fistula or graft is needled, the cannulator has to actually evaluate it, and they go through a process called look, listen, and feel. And in particular, they need to know where the needles go. So for a fistula or graft, there's an arterial needle and a venous needle. The arterial needle goes into the access, takes the blood to the dialysis machine, and brings it back through the venous circuit or the venous needle. And these needles have to be placed at least an inch apart so that there's no recirculation, so that dialyzed blood is not reused. And so this AV access is really critical. It's the lifeline for dialysis. And without the arterial venous access, we cannot transfer that blood from the patient's circulation to the dialysis machine and the filter, which is the dialyzer, and back to the patient. So it has to be very reliable during dialysis. After dialysis is completed, the needles are removed and pressure is placed so that uh, there is no excessive bleeding. Tell me what it's like for the patient to live with an arteriovenous access. So I think the experience of the patient, uh, when I speak to the patients, sometimes it's, you know, anxiety and fear, because when we think about the vascular access, they realize that dialysis is actually going to happen. So there's a little bit of trepidation. But once they are aware that uh, an access is required, it's really important for them to protect that access. And a lot of that focus is actually on them protecting that access. And the experience of the patient would be they are protecting their lifeline. So, for example, before that arterial venous access is created, they really don't want to damage their veins. So we really suggest that there's no venipunctures in the cephalic vein, the antecubital fossa, and we really educate and encourage our patients when blood draws are necessary to do it in the back of their hand. We also encourage them to protect their vessels by avoiding pick lines that could damage the veins so that an arteriovenous fistula can be created And we also tell them that they need to stay fit and to start exercising even before the AV axis is created to help develop that vein. As much as possible, we want them to have a planned start for dialysis and avoid what we call crash starts. Because in these crash starts, they're going to need to have a central venous catheter placed in order to provide dialysis. And when we place a central venous catheter in a patient, that can actually damage vessels so that future AV access is not possible. So the experience of the patient 
you know, before that access creation really is one of protection, protecting themselves to have the best access and lifeline for them. For the patient, once they have the access, are there any limitations to their activities? If you have an AV access, let's say on your left arm, one of the limitations is when you're sleeping, if you're a side sleeper, you don't want to sleep on your left side because you don't want to compress that AV access. So one of the limitations the patient has is to protect their AV access. So uh, for a woman, uh, not carrying a handbag or any types of bags over that AV access so that they're not compressing their vessels. Lifting weights, you can lift weights, but initially after the AV access is created, you want to be very careful not to lift too much. We absolutely encourage exercising to help that fistula mature, but we have to wait at least two weeks. Um, there's no other major limitations. The one thing that they want to look out for is to make sure every day that they feel their fistula and graft to make sure the buzz is there. Sometimes they can put it to their ear to listen to it. So it's not really a barrier, but an additional task that they need to do to make sure that that access is working. If it's not, they would certainly speak to the primary care physician urgently to let them know and have further action based on that. You mentioned a crash start, which I assume is having to start dialysis before a fistula or a graft is ready to be used. At what estimated glomerular filtration rate, which we call EGFR, should the primary care clinician start thinking about referring their patient to a nephrologist? For patients with chronic kidney disease, they should be referred to nephrologists early on. So timely referral is really important. Just to talk about living with chronic kidney disease and discussing the different modalities that are available to the patient. And that's what we call the patient life plan. Once we know that hemodialysis is part of that, we really want the nephrologist to refer to the surgeon for vascular access when their EGFR is between 15 to 20 milliliters per minute, and especially if that is a progressive decline in their EGFR. Sometimes patients will be very stable and have a persistent EGFR of, let's say, 20 milliliters per minute, and that situation, it's not so urgent. But progressive declines in EGFR is certainly when a general practitioner should refer to the nephrologist. So in the patient who has uh, arteriovenous access, that access doesn't last forever. What are some of the common reasons for the access to lose effectiveness? The main reason for AV access to lose effectiveness for a fistula is if it doesn't even get off the ground. So fistulas are complicated by what we call non-usable uh, fistula or fistula that fails to mature. And that can happen in 20 to 60% of cases. And the main reason for that is usually stenosis or thrombosis of the vessel before it gets up and going so that it doesn't mature. Sometimes we have collateral or accessory veins that divert blood flow so that the fistula does not mature. So sometimes the fistula never gets going and it fails right away. For grafts, the main reason is stenosis and thrombosis. And that can occur uh, very, very frequently, particularly after the first one to two years. With that, they need to have many, many interventions. For grafts, they usually have two to three times more thrombosis than fistulas once they're up and running. And they need interventions like angioplasty to maintain their patency. What actually happens during the maturation process? So during the maturation process, firstly, the artery dilates, and that's in response to a fall in the systemic peripheral resistance and an increase in cardiac output. With that dilatation, there is an increase in shear stress of the vessel wall in the vein, and with that, the vein dilates. There's also other hemodynamics that are involved, including hoop stress, which is a, a perpendicular stress that causes the vessel to become tough. And, and this is very, very basic hemodynamics. So essentially with a maturing fistula, the walls dilate and they thicken. Each on its own is not sufficient. You have to have both. And the way I kind of think about it is 
you can take a look at a basketball versus a balloon that are both the same size. And if you put a pin through a balloon, it's going to break. Even though it has that same size, it's very thin. It doesn't have that durability. But if you put a pin through a basketball, you're going to have that toughness and that roundness and that bounce back that would allow cannulation. What are the relative benefits of the fistula versus the graft? If it at all possible, I think a fistula is the preferred AV axis because it's autogenous. And when we're thinking about dialysis and needling, it's going to be easier to heal those puncture wounds than repeated cannulation of graft material, where over time you can actually create lots of holes so that it looks like a Swiss cheese, and that's a limited lifespan for that access. However, it's not quite so easy as that because not everybody can have a fistula for a variety of reasons. And as we mentioned, fistulas do have a high rate of failing to mature, 20 to 60%. Fistulas can mature with intervention and they can have good longevity. However, we do know that fistulas that need a lot of interventions have shorter long-term survival compared to fistulas that don't require any intervention to mature. So I guess for the fistulas, it's really difficult short term sometimes to get them over that hump of maturation. But once they've matured, they actually have good durability and longevity with limited complications such as infection. Grafts have the advantage in that you can use them almost immediately with early cannulation grafts and standard grafts you can use within two to four weeks. So if you need dialysis, you can use the graft right away, and it doesn't have the issues of maturation failure that fistulas do. However, the problem with grafts is that they have a high rate of stenosis and thrombosis. And longer term, you need more interventions to maintain its patency. So whereas you need interventions to facilitate a fistula short term, you need interventions to maintain a graft long term. So those are kind of the risks and benefits of fistulas versus grafts and patency. With regards to other complications, they both have the risk of infection, perhaps slightly more with grafts, but for fistulas, it depends on how you cannulate them. There's different ways to cannulate. One type of cannulation is called rope ladder cannulation, where you rotate the needles, and that has been associated with the fewest infection risks. There is a type of cannulation called buttonhole cannulation that has a high infection risk. So you have to compare that to the potential risk of infections of a graft. Both have risks of steel syndrome and high cardiac output failure. So there are risks and benefits of both. And it really depends also on where the access is placed, if it's forearm versus upper arm, and really the comorbidities of the patient. You mentioned earlier that when the patient goes to the dialysis unit, that the dialysis team will look, listen, and feel. Tell me a little bit about what the primary care clinician should do for examining the fistula or the graft when they're concerned about particular warning symptoms. Look, listen, and feel is really important because there's many complications with AV axis beyond just stenosis and thrombosis that we discussed. So a clinician can look at the axis to see, is there an increased swelling compared to the other extremity? And this may be a sign of stenosis, for example. They can look at uh, the skin quality. Is there signs or symptoms of steel syndrome, thinning of the skin, dry skin, loss of hair? Is there any discoloration? So the look is very important to be able to evaluate all of the different signs and symptoms of complications. And some are not so obvious and some are obvious. Obvious ones include an aneurysm. Is it expanding? Is it growing? The swelling can be quite obvious as well as purulent discharge that may be coming from a infected AV fistula or graft. So that's, look, the listen, you can use the stethoscope and you can hear a brewery. Does it have a systolic and diastolic component? Is it continuous or is it really short? So let's take a listen to a AV access that has a normal sounding brewery. And that is in contrast to an AV access that is abnormal. 
So if you hear an abnormal brewery that sounds like this, then it's really important to refer this patient to the nephrologist and appropriate interventionists for the next steps. Dr. Locke, is there anything else you would like our listeners to know about arteriovenous access for patients on hemodialysis? The arteriovenous access and vascular access really is the lifeline for our patients on dialysis. And it really does take teamwork to maintain these accesses and to keep our patients safe. And the primary care physician is really critically important to help protect our patients, protect their veins, and to manage our patients within the context of end-stage kidney disease. So for example, after an access is created, the patient may have a lot of pain and just be mindful that the patient may still have residual kidney function and to avoid the NSAIDs to preserve that residual kidney function. So these are things that primary care physicians can do to really be part of the team to keep our patients safe and healthy with their AV access on dialysis. Thank you, Dr. Locke, for joining us today to talk about arteriovenous access for hemodialysis. This episode was produced by Daniel Musisi at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.